it just happens that in the old calendar this is the feast of St. Romuald. A saint I have very close to my heart. I'll explain in a few seconds why. This morning a text came out of nowhere from Austria written for some reason in a mis Miscuglio, a mixture of languages. One was a quote in Italian and the rest was in English. And the quote in Italian was this. Sarebbe l'anniversario della morte di allora. Giulia Crotti diventata suor Nazarena. It's a recluse who died in 1990 in Rome in the Camaldolese convent, actually close to where I was living in Rome, on the Aventine. What happened was this. She had, as a young girl, spent a while with the Carmelites, I believe, and then had been led by divine providence to the Camaldolese in Rome. And she had a particular grace. It was that she felt called to live the life of the classical recluses of the Middle Ages. And Providence had put her in the only order where that was going to be possible. The Camaldolis, founded by the saint of this day, St. Romuald, had inbuilt in their structure the two lives. Starting with community and going towards solitude, and for those who were called to it, a very particular vocation, to reclusion which meant never leaving the cell again. Now, this particular recluse was allowed by her lucid superiors to take it on board, but she didn't stop there. Once sealed in her cell, she undertook a life of complete victimhood, which meant that she was on the cross 24-7. She slept on the hard ground without any cushion on a structure that she had invented. It was a bed in the shape of the cross with no cushion or anything and she would sleep on it. She ate for the whole of her life essentially bread and water. A slight variation on a Thursday when something might supplement it, something tiny and on a Sunday but essentially only that until she died. She would not allow anyone at all, even her confessor, a Camaldolese monk, <coughs> to see her face. She was, like the recluses of old, behind this grill, which had also a veil on it. And no one saw her face. She only wanted to be seen by Jesus, whom she loved and served alone on the cross, like him and with him. She was known, however, in the Vatican. So much so that three popes visited her, of course, in the way that they could. They couldn't talk, to her. they might have talked to her but not seen her. But they knew she was there. And we have the talk given by, I suppose it would have been John Paul II by then, because he died in 1990. Yes, I think it was John Paul II. I saw some of what he had to say in the printed speech that he gave there, he'd gone to ask for prayers from the community, but he was very discreet. And he said this, like the other popes who knew before, I know, I know there is among you one who is living in complete hiddenness, and on he went, indicating the importance of that for the whole mystical body. A thing of which Benedict XVI also was fully aware. Why did he opt for essentially a monastic life? in a sort of enclosure in a monastery which John Paul II had put in place there before him. He, John Paul II wanted in the Vatican Gardens this place of prayer that would sustain invisibly the whole mystical body. He knew, as did therefore Benedict XVI, the importance of holding up by this pure gratuitous praise, worship and self-sacrifice the whole of the mystical body. And when that is not there, there is something missing, which is where I want to land. She, this hidden saint, who may be one day canonized, was warning from the depth of her hiddenness and cell, she was warning by her Camaldolese confessor, 
good holy priest. But the Lord did not want things coming into the monastic life which were going to take away its raison d'être. And she knew what she meant and why. She was close, remember, to her spouse and felt what he felt. And she knew that if this powerhouse of prayer and penance protected and utterly orientated was contaminated, diluted, disempowered, then the enemy of the mystical body would have a field day. She died in 1990, but she had lived hidden, seeing, knowing what was going on outside. The monastic life is profoundly hated by the enemy of the church, so he will get at it to make sure that it is of no use. It will do all kinds of useful things for men, but it will forget what it's there for, and that's what he wanted. His great trick was to bring in the world, one bit at a time, one machine at a time. And I saw it actually in my own monastery. I remember it was through the novitiate, through young people coming to us, that we were invited to get involved with more technology. We had no internet, of course. And I remember having a session one time with the brethren, and we had a, a whiz kid of a novice with us, explaining what it was all about, and warning or saying what actually could be useful for or useless with. So we had this, and we voted on it. We kind of discussed in the community, okay, given its advantages, we will allow this to come in. However, and this is the big one at the beginning, never will we have it in our cell. Any messages coming in and out will come in and out in one block, in the morning and in the evening, and only in the scriptorium would there be a computer. And by the way, every Sunday I'd go around with the blessing of these rooms, and the blessing for the scriptorium was the one that we have for the computer room. It was for God. And in there we could actually produce books, which we did. So anyway, what happened? Time goes on. One forgets the first oomph, the first ideal, the first push, the first clear vision. What happens? Years later, it's more convenient to have the machine directly at hand. In they come, into they come, into the house, into the room. And it's more convenient to send out the messages and so on. So what happens? A direct link to internet. In the sanctum of the cella, where actually before no one was allowed to enter, the sanctuary of intimacy, the talamus of intimacy with Jesus. Then what? I notice it bit by bit. There was no question of the likes of mobile phones, it didn't exist. But then bit by bit the superior, or the sub-superior had to have one. And bit by bit, from one to another, in they came. So another channel of communication. Then we had this wonderful system of linking to each other, the intercom in the house, very useful. And then we had also, not immediately, because for years it was just one line to the outside, but then we had this system whereby in our cell we could have access also to the outside phone. And then all that comes from just one decision to have a website and availability for the world. All the world comes in, a plethora of messages comes in from people who haven't even heard of, it's on the other side of the planet, and by the hundred, a lot of them are, of course, nonsense, but nevertheless, they're there, they're energizing, they're taking the energy of the soul, and they're taking from what? What we're there for. And I saw, because they were young and brilliant, how actually things would get done very well, but at a cost. And the cost was interiority. We can't be in contemplative mode and in thinly spread mode at the same time. The head can't manage it. If that's the case in monastic life, my friends, what is it for you? Beware! We only have a short time on earth. Where am I going to spend it? Where is my energy going to go? At the end of life, all these useless SMS, short message service, these texts, these emails, these bits of laughter. What use will they be for my merit in eternity? Quid hoc ad eternitatem? It's worth thinking about it before taking on every day a normality from which, if we're not careful, we'll never, ever escape. Questo anche per voi italiani è vero. 
ho visto non serve avere tutti questi messaggi tutto il tempo c'è un tempo in cui siamo liberi liberi per Gesù solo questo vuol dire escludere almeno in preghiera qualsiasi contatto sino l'invisibile e il trascendente <coughs>